Hello, uh, hi everyone. Good evening to all of you. Uh, thanks a lot for joining the bootcamp on electric vehicle subsystems and technology. Uh, I'm Suraj, I will be the host and also a resource person for today's session. So just before we get started, we are waiting for everybody else to join in. Uh, give us a few more minutes. Uh, we will get started with the session. Okay, so um, good. I think we're just approaching 5.30 uh, to start our session. Let's kind of have a quick chat on the session itself uh, as an overall. And we will wait for other people also to join in the next few minutes. By the way, hi everyone. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, this is Suraj. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Accessibles Lab. It's a great pleasure to be here today uh, on this bootcamp from Decibels Lab. Uh, we're delivering a session to you guys on EV power train technology. So it's a three day program as you might have all read through this website and have understood you know, what is the scope of this uh, bootcamp is all about. On the first day we will cover about uh, you know, subsystems where we talk about you know different components and uh, what is their technology and you know why do we need them in EVs and stuff like that and then we go to day two where we talk about uh, component sizing and stuff and then we talk about day three with uh, you know vehicle testing and data acquisition systems. Okay, so the overall idea for you now is that this bootcamp can give you a fair understanding of EV. Uh, I'm not sure that you, know, you might, you guys are just beginners here, so or you might have already have some exposure to technology and all this stuff. So just to do that, let's let's get introduced to each other. So it would be helpful so that I can deliver the session uh, to exactly meet your learning requirements. So we have given you an option to unmute yourself as well. So any of you who are participating today, uh, we'll be very glad to know from your side that uh, what interests you to pick up this session today. And if you have any expectations or learning outcomes, uh, it would be great to hear from you. Uh, anybody who is here would like to share any of your specific inputs to the session. Fantastic. So Ankit from Delhi doing masters in EV technology. Very interesting. Great. So anybody else would like to <clears throat> uh, share that, you know, what interests you to take up the course today? And if you have any specific learning expectations, you know, what are those learning expectations as well from your side? Thanks. This is Raghuvi speaking. I work in EOD trucks in Great. powertrain team. Uh -huh. Currently looking after powertrain, uh, conventional powertrain, and interested in electric powertrain to understand more. As I said, the basics, uh, how the sizing is done. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, looking forward. 
yeah so looking forward for the session thank you thank you good good to hear that from you uh, as we so uh, i i would definitely try to put across the session uh, as best as possible so that you would get the best learning opportunity right so anybody else who is in the session today uh okay let's kind of quickly do this because you know let's say a lot of time to um uh, deliver the session we just like you know budging in some time so that you know other people also join quickly as well awesome i would see some texts on the chat box here okay uh madhusudan from chennai awesome so looking forward to learn fundamentals and uh, learn about ev uh west bengal work in aerospace sector wow that's great uh cannot hear audio i just to confirm with all of you i i believe my voice is audible to all of you uh, i hope that's all good okay perfect uh nagaraju i think you can just check uh, from your side if there is any issues uh to connect the audio i think it's good uh, for everyone at this moment okay perfect uh anybody else uh have any expectations um from this session any specific expectations that you have learn about future technology awesome uh make ev part and model in simulink okay um punal maybe that is little out of the scope for the session because somebody has to know a um, lot of things you know before jumping into simulation um, because i have seen some people teaching part in simulation in simscape like uh, tom dick and harry but uh, you know it's just not the way we teach it it's, it's from fundamental equations and stuff like that it it requires some amount of time to uh, teach that properly so it may not be a scope today as a part of it but I, we can give you an idea of how is it done and what kind of uh, studies are done to develop a part train okay so selection of components awesome so looks like there are interesting participants and that's really exciting for us to get the session started perfect looking forward for ev packaging and vehicle design point of view and also estimation of range and battery spec awesome uh okay pravin i think uh, we will we will try to touch base uh, to the best of our possibilities in sessions here or i can personally help you out as well to learn further uh, in terms of uh, uh, what exactly you want to do in range estimations and stuff like that uh, nothing to worry on that um perfect so without wasting much of our time let's get started i think we have more than about 70 participants today at the session all right so um yeah i am suraj again let's not to give too much of gap about what we do and stuff so um i'm suraj as i said i'm the course director at decibel lab and also i'm the co-founder and ceo of decibel lab so i i worked for some time in the industry with some projects for mercedes i was at chrysler uh, back in united states at detroit uh, so we started the company in 2019 uh, to create a platform for learning and uh, you know it was pretty much confined for industry and when the covid hit in so things were very limited so we brought up an online learning platform so today we have more than about 31000 users globally in about 20 22 months uh, from the inception of uh, online learning platform so very great to have you here today uh, on this journey of uh, teaching and then you know share our knowledge in in the series of boot camps so um the objective of this boot camp is pretty simple that uh, we would be able to cover some of the topics that you get an idea on at a very overview level and then if you would like to learn deeper then we can talk to you personally and you know help you with the further learning process i think just um, as a overview i always start that uh, um why ev so that we could just jump into the further discussions quickly all right i would not take much time to start up with the session
So everybody says like, you know, EV is eco-friendly and it's fantastically great. And how do you justify EVs are eco-friendly? Anyone here quickly, as quick as you answer, so as quick as we follow the course as well. So how do you justify EVs are eco-friendly? I would like that answers to be with, you know, analytical figures, facts, to prove that, you know, EVs are eco-friendly. Because all of you want to learn future technology, you want to work in the future technology, but how do you justify EV is eco-friendly? Anyone? Uh, you have an option to unmute as well. Less natural resources are used. Okay. What else? Quickly. So, to my knowledge, uh, you use like when they, it is all, and the area which they are running, it might be eco friendly. Okay. But uh, when it is being charged during charging, it is consumed by a mostly by a thermal power. It right. might pollute the environment near the uh, generating area. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thanks a lot for barging in, Mr. Um, so, anybody else? So anybody else quickly, how do you prove like, you know, see, you want to work in technology and, you know, everybody says EV is eco-friendly, but, you know, how do you prove it? You see, there's an emissions happening at a thousand you know, production plant. How do you, how do you justify? Uh, sir, this is Satish here. Yes. Hi, Satish. Hi. So what I think is the efficiency of the vehicle, the IC mm -hmm. vehicles are very poor. Uh -huh. So that when when we can take the EV into the comparison, we right. can achieve more than ninety percent of efficiency. Okay. okay. So even though the fossil fuel, the natural minerals, even though we use it, mm -hmm. the consumption rate is much lesser when compared to uh, the normal IC vehicles. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Thanks a lot, Satish, for budging in. A great answer. So I see some answers also from the chat box that current less carbon footprints uh, is left when used renewable energy. Fantastic. EVs are more efficient than IC engines for uh, generation we use. We can use solar. Awesome. So, you know, I, I like the answers. You know, the thing is we are engineers, right? We, we always prove the things analytical way. So, I mean, if somebody tells me, hey, it's, it's like this, it's like this, but, you know, you, as an engineer, we always would ask them, can you prove it technically? Can you prove it mathematically? That, you know, this is how the number wise, it would exactly look right, right? So that's, that's what we're gonna just jump into it. So when I say about this whole process, which is happening here, a lot of our energy being produced at thermal power stations. So that basically means either coal or nuclear or possibly you get an energy from natural uh, gases as well, right? So there's extraction of coal, transportation of coal, and then converting a chemical energy into a thermal energy, then the thermal energy to the um, uh, you know, mechanical energy, uh, it's in the terms of rotation for the, the turbine, and then that internally converts the energy to uh, electricity and then transportation <laughs> with the, the transportation you have a lot of uh, you know losses and then it finally you get that energy into the wall socket and then at the wall socket you again convert from ac to dc you put that dc to the battery in the form of chemical energy and then that you convert a chemical energy into an electrical energy to the motor controller then that chemical electrical energy get converted into a mechanical energy at the motor. So when you see through the whole process, there's a lot of losses, right? With this process as well. So that's why we need to somehow come up with an exact picture that how we can prove EVs are eco-friendly than just jumping into any technical detailed topic. Anyway, this is a overall idea where we trying to come up with, okay, this is the sources of energy. We'll not go much into it. I think everybody can get an awareness of this by seeing this slide. Now there are Two import, three important things when somebody talks EV is eco-friendly, okay? Somebody was answering, okay, between here to here, if you charge the vehicle and run the vehicle, there is no emissions, okay? It's great, it's fantastic. But what happens that where the electricity come from, right? The electricity come from long way to the to the charging stations at or the, your house sockets, right? So in the process of it, you make a lot of emissions as well, a lot of losses as well. So how do you account for those losses, right? So then when you consider overall, when you call any system is efficient, we always should compare something with a well to wheels, right? So well to wheels means here we will be able to justify that by the whole process, we will be able to still define that EVs are eco-friendly from the extraction to a uh, running of the electric vehicle, right? So then if you see here, there is some number that is put on the screen. We says that annual, if you run a, 
a mid-sized vehicle like Maruti Swift for about 18,000 kilometers, how, do, how much of emissions do you make? Okay, if you run it with the gasoline, like petrol, you make, make about 11,000 LBS and then the details are on the screen. Okay, this is what the data says, but can you prove it? How true is this? How can you rely on somebody just publishing the data from the internet, right? We are all engineers. We don't just trust information by newspapers, right? So somehow we need to prove it. So here I've taken an analogy and a very simple one. And it's not a very uh, detailed PhD study. Uh, you could see like uh, uh, Activa, which is here, and a uh, Aether, which is here. We predict that Activa gives about 50 kilometers per liter. And Aether gives about 80. It is actually 75. Okay, what is defined on the website? That's what we have taken as of today. So calorific value of petrol is this, 9528 watt per liter. Then you put a math into a picture. It's a very simple one. You know, you, you guys can also follow along with me. Not a big stuff. So calorific value by range, you consume about 190.56 watt per kilometer. This is pump to wheel. But when you consider a well to wheel, I have put across everything through a one number that is a 67%. Again, how the 67% come from? It come from some specific sources that is published by MHR, no, uh, uh, oil ministry and stuff like that. The data is available on the internet. So then if you go down here with all these losses, you put the number, it comes about 284.4 watt hour per kilometer, right? That is the energy you consume for running a car, bike for one kilometer, like active for one kilometer. You compare the same with Aether here. Right, it is about 75. You put the number 75. So, 7 2400 is a battery pack size, right? 2.4 kilowatt. It is an Aether's previous model, 450. So, then if you put about 32 watt hour per kilometer, if you compare these two numbers, right, this number and this number, you get a complete difference in what energy does your IC engine consume, what energy does your uh, electric vehicle consume. So, once you do that, then there are some losses also. It is not like ideal system. The charging and discharging losses are there, it is 80%. And then we have a very bad efficiency um, for our transportation as well. Now let's start with this one, 80%. So it's 32 by 8.8. So it's about 40 watt hour per kilometer. That's how much you consume for a single charge, including your charging and discharging efficiency. Now you come down here, production and transmission efficiency of the electricity is about 30% because the lot of losses are there in the production the thermal system. So you put all that, you get this number. It is 133, it is 284. You can straight away tell Activa consumes much more than a Aether, right? I believe you all agree analytically. Now let's go to the next slide and uh, where we try to, okay, we'll not go to this slide again. It's the same comparison as the time limitations. Uh, we, I don't go through this, but it's a similar one. There is some, again, references I've taken it from. The, CO2 content, right? CO2 content of coal is 660 grams per kilowatt. If you want to produce one kilowatt, so you make about 660 grams of carbon into the atmosphere and a full combustion. And again, same thing with a fuel is about 530 grams uh, per kilowatt. Now, you know, this is a figure, right? So, which is about 284 and it is about 133. You can substitute these values to this one and make a math, 660, uh, to to Aether and 532 Activa, right? So it's for one kilowatt, but here it is somewhere about nearly like a quarter kilowatt, right? 284. So if you substitute this number here, you get a value which is 150. And for the Aether, it is 87.99. It's about 88 grams. So if you compare there, here itself is eco-friendliness of EV will clearly understood even though you charge the EV from thermal power plant running from coal, right? This is a, a bare possibility that you can easily expect higher efficiency uh, in the EV system and lower carbon production into the atmosphere. Hence, EV is eco-friendly. Now, on top of this, if you charge the vehicle by solar, uh, wind, any renewable sources, imagine this number will be like what? Uh, if you go back to the slide, right? Uh, we, we don't have to put this value at all. Somewhere I'm just giving you a rough estimate, right? So that means like it's like 40, even you add like 20% uh, efficiency loss in whatever the system it is, it's like what? 50 watt hour per kilometer. It is far beatable than compared to any you know, two-wheeler, uh, IC engine two-wheeler, right? These numbers will be like, like, like somewhere about like 
like 30 to 35 watt of 30 to 35 grams of co2 per kilometer so i believe you all agree now that uh, how ev is eco friendly uh, is there any questions uh, from the audience on this okay so it's pre pretty clearly proven as as we understand now and you can justify to anyone that you know how we can prove this then on top of all these things right if you take an ic engine when you service a car or service a bike the oil is basically need to be replenished right so i mean who does really replenishing of an oil you just dump a new oil and then what happens to the old oil it's really known to anyone right a lot of moving parts a lot of servicing is required and all those consume material again materials means extraction processing refining and then making a final product all of this makes emission so considerably there is a very less moving parts less amount of maintenance is required even in the secondary emissions also e proves to be more worthier for environment as well but there is a concern on batteries okay there is a regulation everybody says do not throw the cell into the dustbin okay but how many of us follow very greatly it's a problem again if you don't do certain things which are guided in a proper way obviously you can't expect things to go really great so government will come up with some schemes where they will tell that you have to recycle a battery and all the stuff in place so at that time everything becomes a, a systematic approach they may tag every battery with a specific id and something should happen digitally it will happen because we're just about 10 years old uh, baby as a ev in place right so with all of that said and done uh, we could sell that okay ev is largely eco friendly there are a lot of dependencies on lithium and all this blah blah stuff i think there is there is a lot of debate that we can all do but in overall way at a picture clear at it now that you know ev is somewhere better than some of the systems in place cool um any questions on this topic uh, from anyone i i don't know whether i have made any mistakes in the calculations if you guys tell that you know there is some correction so we'll be always happy to go back and make them great so it's it's pretty on to the spot there so now let's understand some of the subsystems as i said today is not about calculations so today about understanding subsystem right so let's start ahead with the some of the subsystems so as everybody know like there is a transmission there is a motor there is a motor controller then there is a battery pack and then there is an onboard charger and dc dc converter and there is a battery management system then there is a heater and a compressor and some other components now let's today we'll just take a quick look into all the subsystems how much ever is possible within the given timeline of up to 630 all right so now if we get started with the first subsystem okay let's say uh let's go to this so transmission and motor you know motor and a transmission so let's get uh, a first question from the audience why do you say we need a transmission or why do you say we don't need a transmission in ev anybody can can give an answer why why don't we just use hub motor for all the vehicles why do you think you need a transmission make it you more complicated than uh, then how it can do most simplicity simplicity uh, sir transmission system is used to produce the energy from the ic engines which convert our required torque and uh, in a, a speed mm -hmm. okay good 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 anybody else uh, sir it reduces the size of the machine which we are using i'm sorry could you please repeat i didn't hear you well sorry uh, it reduces the size of the drive which we are using sir fantastic it reduces the size okay what are what are other things anybody can quickly come up uh, with uh, any answer um sir transmission mm -hmm. hello sir mm -hmm. yeah please go ahead sir, sir transmission changes the power output sir torque it changes the torque okay it first gear it gives more torque and for high gear it gives more power all right all right of a good good to get an answer from all of your side now let's get into a little bit of a technicals all right so one second let me just kind of uh, okay i did something that uh, i shouldn't have 
All right. So I just won't edit. Cool. So when you say, uh, let's just kind of one second, I would like to bring up the screen so that uh, you all can see through it. Okay. So when we say we need a transmission, right? Now let's try to write down a few things. So everybody knows that, okay, uh, what is the torque, I know, of the torque produced by the IC engine, right? Let's say uh, this is a torque produced by the IC engine, right? And let's say this is a torque produced by a motor. And this is a required torque at the wheel, okay? This is what your vehicle demands, okay? There are three graphs right now we are trying to draw. One, the, the characteristic graph of the IC engine, right? This is an IC engine. And uh, let's say this is motor. And let's say this is your vehicle. So if, if you could draw a line, right? So let's say, let's start from here. So a typical graph of a IC engine, you have studied in their college days and something like that. So a graph would come something like this and then slowly it will come down and uh, then that's the way it looks typically and then we have an rpm graph as well so if you take a motor so the motor characteristic curve comes something like this all right so now can anybody tell how does a torque characteristic curve of the ev would look like sorry vehicle would look like Uh, vehicle is initially low torque when compared to the motor. Motor is initially uh, high, high torque. High torque. Okay. So can you give me an idea? How does it looks like? Does it looks like IC engine thing, or does it looks like a motor thing? It looks like an IC engine. Okay. Okay. Uh, perfect. Anybody else? Motor, IC engine, completely different than both of them. First, the torque will be more. As a speed increases, torque becomes related to Absolutely. Right? So first what happens, the torque is really high. See, that's when you start a bike, right? You put the vehicle in the first gear. Or let's, let's not take a uh, starting case. If you're going in an uphill condition, correct? When you're going in an uphill condition, which gear do you put your vehicle in? It means you put in the lower gear. Why do you put it? Because you need a higher torque. Because there is a lot of higher resistive forces because there is a theta on the road, right? That means there is a high torque required. So if you consider that comparative scenario, just a simple analogy in place, that typically the torque group comes something like this, right? Imagine if it is a flat road, on the flat road, you want to uh, get the vehicle from zero to kilometers to 80 kilometers per hour. So the torque is really, really high in the beginning. Gradually the torque reduces and the vehicle achieves the momentum and then the vehicle maintains the speed in place. But obviously the torque is required, but it may be, it is slowly starting to reduce. Now, if you compare this, 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 this three, which drive system is more effective, right? Mm -hmm. So here only it tells that if you put the IC engine to the vehicle directly without coupling any transmission, the IC engine will not be able to give you a right amount of torque for the desired output of the desired demand of the vehicle, correct? Because the torque of the vehicle required is this, right? IC engine is not in that way. That is why what we do in, in uh, IC engines, we use, we use a transmission gear ratio, right? We have a first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, right? Fifth gear. We, you, we use a combination of gear ratio so that we will be able to convert the RPM to top, top to RPM in proportionate manners. But if you take a beauty of an electric vehicle, it is almost same. What you require in the vehicle is equivalent to what you almost produce from the electric vehicle, correct? So in this scenario, which you observed right now, that that is why you can use actually motor in the wheel itself called as a hub motor configuration because the motor has a higher torque output capabilities in the starting lower speed uh, in place. Any questions from anyone on this topic that I believe it is pretty clear? 
that uh, how exactly the torque characteristics of the vehicle looks like or the torque characteristics of the um, uh, motor look like. Anybody have any questions uh, I would I'd like to address uh, those questions, please. All right. Okay, there is one. Uh, no questions. Perfect. Right. So an idea is why transmission comes in here. So now imagine you are trying to go back and see that, okay, there is a transmission used in. Let's clear this out. Now you see that the Aether uses transmission, right? Why do you think they wanted to use a transmission? Why it was not sufficient that, okay, you could just use a hub motor, all right? So there are a lot of considerations why it is done like that, okay? So there are a lot of parameters which you can just take and uh, think through. One, it depends upon what kind of vehicle that you want to design, all right? Let's start one by one. So vehicle performance. Right, so in parameters like this, if you try to keep the motor within the hub, right, there is just limitations in terms of the size of the motor. Maybe it is in terms of uh, volume, also in terms of the mass, right? So there's a limitation in terms of volume, also mass of the motor. Then these two things can impact the vehicle dynamics because if you're trying to keep the motor within the hub of the wheel you're adding a more mass to the wheel and there is a limitation that how much you can put inside the wheel because wheel size is limited let's say 17 inch 16 inch whatever the inch is there right so that is all limited so you have a specific size or a volume that is available for you to put something inside the wheel. So that is where it is a limitation comes. When, when you try to put a bigger motor, it means let's say you want to produce a lot of torque, right? The so torque is directly proportional to anyone. Uh, torque is directly proportional to what? Distance of the force. In electrical terms, power. in a specific to motor, right? Power. It is current, right? Torque is directly proportional to flux. Flux is directly proportional to current. So you supply more current, you produce more flux, the more flux produce more torque, right? So now in this scenario, if you want to produce more torque, it means you need to produce more flux. It means the width of the motor has to be very large so that you can produce an enormous amount of a torque at the motor. So it means more the motor torque is going to be, more the motor size is going to be, right? So with that way, you can't just keep the big motor in the wheel, right? Because you have a space limitation. In the same way, the volume also increases. So you don't have a volume to keep the motor in the wheel. See, let's say you are able to keep that. Today, you see a lot of two-wheelers have a hub motor. Why is that possibly? Because this, the output torque of the motor is slightly not so higher than compared to a, something like Aether, right? So Aether has a very uh, high performance requirements compared to other vehicles, right? Because that is in comparison with Activa today. Right? It, it almost matches and goes above the matching of Activa. So now, if you want to keep uh, such a high configuration within the wheel, then you have a vehicle dynamic issue. Because imagine you're going on a highway or a road, uh, you hit a pothole, then there's a lot of mass in the wheel, and that means inertia is carried. That would do an imbalance in the vehicle dynamics. It, it becomes a problem for how to manage your uh, vehicle dynamics in place. Or tomorrow, if you want to go for a... Um, any changes in the whole system, you need to put a whole system into a place uh, with a wheel. But here, when you go for a non-hub motor configuration, you have a lot of flexibility and a freedom to tune your gear ratios and achieve what you optimally want as a output, right? So then again, if you want to just keep the motor within the wheel, uh, it, it, it becomes very challenging to make the motor operate at an efficiency point, all right? So just to kind of zoom out this picture, let me just try to bring the picture into this slide. What exactly this image uh, tells you is, uh, this is for the different uh, motor, okay, this is for Nissan Leaf, the efficiency map. So what exactly is efficiency map is trying to tell you? It is trying to tell that motor is not efficient in all the regions effectively, right? So if you see here, the motor is highly efficient. It is about 97% efficiency in this region. Slowly efficiency drops, right? Like this, the efficiency again drops down here. Then the efficiency slowly drops down. 
the objective is efficiency depends upon the rpm under speed also it depends upon temperature as well but right now we will keep temperatures and out of the topic because we are talking about transmission so you want to operate the motor as much as here within the given time right because you have a highest efficiency of the motor being represented but if you what happens is if you have a transmission you have a feasibility to switch you know you have a feasibility to operate the motor within the desired region by changing the gear ratios though ether is a fixed gear ratio but they do have a certain predictable freedom in making that happen but when you take a hub motor hub motor has to produce whatever the torque the vehicle demands are going everywhere along the whole cycle okay in it has to travel all across the whole journey of the motor efficiency correct in that way transmission has a vital role to size the motor it also has a vital role to make the motor operate at a better efficiency points okay and keep the motor within its better uh, safety operating limits in place and take an advantage of transmission uh, system um this is a, a very uh, overview of uh, why transmission is required and you know how do we make use of transmissions and stuff like that um so again there are a lot of complexities should we go for a transmission in your vehicle uh, should you do it or should not we do it you know, it's it's a big big case study okay you need to run at decibels like you know if you want to perform powertrain simulation studies for any company if it is a four wheeler we take about 1000 hours if it is a two wheeler it's about 500 to 600 hours of efforts just to give a decision that what really happens in your system when you have multiple configurations in place because it's a lot of efforts lot of test cases lot of scenarios to arrive at one specific point and a value of a motor or a battery or a conductor contactor any of the other components that come as a whole part of it right so it's it's a lot of thing but in the in the very overview of it this is what it looks like so any questions from anyone okay good uh looks like no questions i believe it's going as an understanding not as like you know over the head in place i believe so then on top of these things let's take some points to the motors as a details so what is the difference between motors used in just normal applications and motors used for ev applications all right so one the motors in ev are subject to a large amount of mvh noise vibration and harshness because the road conditions are pretty awesome so obviously they will subject the motor to undergo a lot of vibration so it has to be capable of handling that then temperature because the motor is op operated at very wide range of uh, environmental conditions maybe today you operated you drive a vehicle in chennai awesome pretty hot temperature then you take it to some of the places where the temperatures are very low like in uti or you take an vehicle to uh, coastal areas where there is a salt in the air then in similarly like that you take it to any other place the motor is always subjected to a lot of environmental conditions one of the condition is temperature right so then what else so ip ratings you don't want water to go inside the vehicle right even we we get uh, the vehicle submerged in the water you should not go inside then uh, wide range of torque and speed output right you want the motor to give you a good amount of speed and torque at any given bandwidth right so because you are using the motor dynamically the load is not constant in avs right it is drastically varying then efficiency of the motor because higher the efficiency of the motor lower the energy you consume okay if you want to do a math uh, i'll just show you around some example cases okay uh, so i don't know how much time we have but i always feel like if you're teaching something teach it properly um so you go and compare just two vehicles okay so one is ether and uh, it ether specs and then the other way you just take uh, um bajaj uh, uh, tvs iq okay 
so all we have to do is just compare two things together all right and then uh, you just have to come to arrive at conclusion that okay what is the range i think we just take it from proper ethers website and at tvs iq uh, we just take specifications okay so we come to some conclusion here that okay uh, i think this is not sufficient for us to just decide right okay so this may be sufficient it says that eco friendly is 75 and then whatever the mode let's take with eco friendly all right so you're getting a 75 kilometers we already talked talked about this and uh, the battery pack capacity is 2.71 i think this should be a latest mode of a uh, vehicle and then if you go to a um, tvs iq right so maybe you can get some specifications here okay motor capacity is 4.4 kilowatt the battery capacity is 2.25 right let's get some range uh it is 75 kilometers per charge when you do a comparison between you know uh this to this and this to this you get a pretty much of difference in the value you know what do you get so let's go back here it is 75 and here we could get a performance of 75 you get somewhere about for a ether average energy consumption per kilometer comes somewhere about 32 watt hour per kilometer okay again when you compare the same vehicle similar segment vehicle with bajaj chetak or rtvs iq you can get a comparison that okay how much they were able to optimize the uh, you know uh, a system in place uh, with compared to any of the other competitors in the market and coming back to the screens here let's go back to the presentation okay so efficiency of the motor and then there are several other parameters that will influence uh, uh, a motor selection for a ev applications as well so now any other questions from any of you we can just go in here or we will just move to our next topic correct right. so going to the next topic uh, which is motor controller right so why do we need a motor controller and what are the functionalities of a motor controller as simple as that very basic functionality of a motor controller is taking care of speed and torque of the motor right just just as simple as that then apart from these functions it takes care of a lot of other things right so to get started with first you supply the dc right to the motor controller so you need to convert the dc to ac right so there is a lot of power electronics that is sitting inside the motor controller which is constantly converting ac dc to ac because you are supplying ac to lot of motors that are used in evr ac motors so you have to supply ac then the first functionality is conversion of dc to ac now next thing is once the ac is produced you need to supply an exact amount of current to the specific windings right and you need to excite the coils in a specific manner so it take care so something called regulating the current regulating the amount of current that should go and it should also take care of how much what frequency with which it should switch the coils in place right so by that way you will be able to control the speed of the motor also control the torque of the motor by doing so you will be able to get a desired torque output at the wheel then in the other terms of it so it also need to understand the behavior of the road conditions so what are those behavior of the road conditions let's say you are going on the uphill the engine is supposed the motor is supposed to understand that okay there is an uphill condition by the way it doesn't have an eyes and ears to see if it is an uphill right so it has a map it has an algorithms right so which is uh, something like an pid tuning so you have a throttle you give an x amount of throttle you are expecting y amount of speed so if you are not achieving that speed with the x amount of throttle being pressed you go back to the map and correct it okay this is what i am supposed to be at but i am not able to be at this point then i should supply a more torque to the motor because the load is more on the motor it supplies that so like this there is a lot of activity that it does take care of it being a, a power electronic system and a control system in place so to do this this lot of algorithms 
right? Very simple like speed torque control, right? Speed torque control. Then there is uh, direct torque control. There's field orientation control, field weakening control. Right, like this, so many methods are there, which are basically algorithms, which can efficiently control the motor, correct? So that is that is what sits inside the controller. Basically, what you see here is the state of art uh, microcontrollers, right? So there is where the core of control algorithm will sit. The rest is a lot of peripherals are there, okay? Power management circuits are there. For example, you want to supply, 3.3 volts to the controller for it to work. But the motor controller is connected to 300 volt system, right? Because let's say DC battery pack is in, in, in uh, some vehicles like Tata Nexon, it's like 320 volts. Let's just take an exa example like that. 320 volt battery pack is connected to motor controller. But your controller works at 3.3 volt, right? So there has to be some circuit which take case of converting that 300 volts to 3.3 volts, right? Because you don't have any other external power supply to supply to the motor controller. So there is a lot of circuitry that take care of uh, power electronics for non-driving requirements, some for driving other driving requirements. Again, the motor controller also gives you the outputs to the throttle, right? I'm just giving some example, throttle. So throttle requires five volts, correct? Or some throttle even require 3.3 volt, just in case in some scenarios. So how do you supply five volts? You supply five volts from motor controller only, right? To the throttle. Because throttle should work. If it has to work, it has to supply get a uh, five volts input. Like in similar, there are a lot of inputs and outputs. Let's say there is a sensor. Let's say there's a temperature sensor. Again, there are many types of temperature sensors. Uh, so, if you have a temperature sensor, it requires a voltage input. You may have to supply like five volts of input to the temperature sensor as well. Like in similar, it takes care of supplying a lot of uh, you know in, uh, uh, inputs to the uh, uh, sensors or or any other systems in place. Or maybe there is an example that there's a fan, right, uh, connected to a motor. So sometimes, most of the times, the fan is driven by a motor controller. So because there's a temperature sensor, it identifies the temperature being raised and then the, it turns on the fan. So if you want to on the fan, obviously it is working at like 12 volt, right? So it means it should also have an output that gives 12 volts from the motor controller so that you can directly run the fan. Or there may be a pump if it is a cooling system. Maybe sometimes pump is typically having another auxiliary input, but fan is a very simple device so it can just directly run from the motor. Now you understand that there are a lot of functions that a motor controller take care of. Then on top of all these things, you know, you might have seen in Ether, you have like some modes, right? That we have been going through in the last slide, like last image. It's like, uh, what is it called? Uh, CT ride, sport ride, and then echo, echo mode, right? So in echo mode, you can get a lot higher, higher efficiency, okay? How? By compensating the performance. You won't get a very high performance, but you get a range. But on the other side, like a sport mode, right? You get a you get a performance, but you lose the range. End of the day, whatever the energy is stored in the battery is only the energy you can use, right? Anything more than that you can't use because it's not available. So by the way, motor controller limits the current that goes to the motor. By that way. The performance of the motor is limited. By limiting the performance, you get a extended range, right? But the same way, the same vehicle just switch to a sport mode. You didn't make any changes in the motor, motor or a physical hardware. But just by making those changes, you, you are able to um, get higher performance. But on top of it, you you lost some range that the vehicle can give you, right? This is these are all the functionalities. The motor controller will uh, take care of it. All right. There are some questions, Ashutosh. Um, why will not use DC motor instead of AC motor? Good. So DC motors, if you compare, very few parameters. If I go back here, right. So you can say power density with respect to two terms, watt per kg. Right, 
Varta per liter. Right? So, these are the two important things. So, motors, AC motors exhibit a better characteristics. It means it's, it weighs less. It also gives you a, uh, it, it also consumes less volume. And these motors are very highly efficient. On top of all these things, the control algorithms are more advanced for AC motors. Okay. So, in this way, the motors, AC motors are more suitable for EV applications than DC motors. Perfect. So, any other questions uh, from anyone? Okay, uh, Kazim has a question. Does this motor controller also take care of recuperation too? Yes. So again, not all the motor controllers can take care of recuperation. The recuperation means region radio braking, if I understood correctly from your side. So not every motor controller has the function, but if you see a motor controller with the function of region radio braking, yes, it can take care of it. And there is also a functionality of a motor controller as well. Awesome. So any other questions from anyone? Can we use PCB over microcontrollers for domestic uses? Okay, see, PCB is a hardware, right? So end of the day, microcontroller has to be there. You can use something like a very specific application, like, like a simple fan, okay, which you use in your house. Again, you use a regulator for you know taking care of certain speed inputs and stuff like that. Microcontroller is something where you would be able to take a best advantage of the motor but you would have to have a lot of technical stuff to make that happen. But you would not need it for a very simple applications, but you would need a microcontroller for a complicated applications. Okay, any other questions? Right, so looks like we are pretty good on to our discussions. Um, all right. So, you know, I would, uh, so then there are a lot of options how you can do, okay. Uh, you, you don't need a processor to perform a functionality for microcontrollers. Um, I think, yeah, you could, you could take a little deeper look into that. We can have a discussion on that as well. Okay. So it's running fast. Um, let's cover up some more, uh, subsystems. Now let's talk about cells modules and battery technology so you already know that okay you get a cells from specific supplier right so not uh Maruti makes their own cells uh not honda make their own cells they buy cells from samsung lg panasonic somebody like tesla i don't know they have a factory on their own but they partnered with panasonic right so they partnered with panasonic and also they have partnered with somebody in china uh cattle so to manufacture cells for them so that means technology of cells itself is a very large expertise for somebody to own that's why companies outsource the technology because manufacturing of cells doesn't mean that you just have a plant you have a research center you also have to have a mines to get the material and it's not just easy as a company as an automotive your focus is not about mines right your focus is more about building the vehicle and selling the vehicle so that's why companies like Tata Motors or Maruti or Mahindra they partner with cell manufacturers cell manufacturer will partner with somebody like material manufacturers somebody they will again partner with somebody who have a ore right so Jindal may not own a ore, but they would have a contract with somebody who can supply a, a ore to them. The same way the whole ecosystem exists in automotive industry as well. So you get a material from a manufacturer and then the LG or Samsung has the R&D capabilities to use that materials to manufacture cells. So end of the day, you get a cell and then you, you combine the cell to form a module. So module is a smaller subset of a is a subset of a uh, battery pack right so you get a cell module and then a pack so they all come together to form a big larger battery pack 
something like tesla like like a vehicle like this right so it's a older model model s so it had about 7000 cells the cells comes in various different formats you get cylindrical prismatic and a pouch cell and they come in various different chemistries as well now let's go to the next slide i as i was trying to brief you about different talk about chemistries so whatever we see today is called lithium okay whenever people talk about lithium it's not just one chemistry okay there are multiple chemistries within lithium are lithium based cells so there is something like lco lithium cobalt oxide right lithium manganese oxide or lithium nickel cobalt aluminum nickel manganese cobalt or lithium ferrous phosphate so all of these cells are based out of lithium but they have their own specific characteristics okay this is on cathode materials again in the anode materials you have carbon you have silicon you have uh, lto or li also as a material but largely today lot of companies use graphite as a anode material and the cathode material is depending upon whichever the company you are reliably able to trust on their chemistry something like lfp right you might have heard about lithium ferrous phosphate the characteristic curve and the safety parameter of a lithium are two different things if i kind of draw you on on graph here um let me just uh, put it across here right if you take lithium ion uh, lithium ferrous phosphate lfp cell lfp cell right the characteristic curve of lfp cell will come something like this i mean i'm just drawing some very basic one so this is a voltage this is soc okay so what happens is a nominal voltage for a lithium ion cell is 3.3 3.2 volts okay so it means a cell's nominal voltage is a representation that we use for making a battery pack if you want to build a battery pack of 48 volts right 48 divided by 3.2 is what you get as a number of cells okay so let me just draw it here so if you want to build a 48 volt battery pack it is 48 divided by 3.2 this is for lfp if you take a chemistry like nmc the nominal voltage is the same battery for 48 volt the nominal voltage is 3.8 sorry it's 3.8 so if you divide this parameter right you get you need to use more number of cells if you use lfp okay but you need to use less number of cells maybe like difference of i'm just giving you a uh, i think you all can do a math as well along with me it's not a big one 48 divided by 3.2 right so it's 15 cells you need to make a 48 volt battery pack but here if you see 48 divided by 3.8 48 divided by sorry divided by 3.8 you use 12.6 cells you can't make 12.6 so it's 13 cells So what a difference you got, right? So you use thirteen cells to make a forty-eight volt battery pack. It is also made from lithium-based chemistry, but you need fifteen cells to make a battery pack of LFP chemistry. That means the the weight of the battery pack is going to be higher. The volume of the battery pack is going to be also higher. So you see a challenges, right? You see a cons, but also on the other side, LFP is more safer, right? LFP chemistries. more safer nmc is more dangerous it means like not a danger means as a serious thing it's it's little susceptible than lfp for impact of temperature or 
thermal runaway scenarios. Okay. Cautions. So what do you do if you have a matured BMS technology? You are you are already worked enough on uh, tech of batteries. Then you can go with this chemistry. So you can take an advantage of the nominal voltage, right? But if you go to a LFP chemistry, you you would have a safety margin, right? You you can expect that your vehicle may not catch a fire. I mean, just giving you a rough estimation, right? But it may also. But it is more safer. So how do you decide which one do you want? It depends upon what technical maturity the company has, what supplier network it has, what is your pricing point of the battery, what is your pricing point of the vehicle. A lot of these things will come to a conclusion to define, okay, what chemistry that you want to use in your vehicle. Okay, upon that, it's not just a chemistry. It, you need to have a tons of data that you would have tested the cell and prove prove on the cell that that is suitable, right? Only upon that, you will be able to choose a right cell. That itself is a daunting amount of efforts to choose a cell chemistry, choose a, to choose a supplier and stuff like that. This is just a very, very basic session to give you an idea on, uh, you know, overview of um, cell basics, okay? Like now, if you come to, let me just draw one more curve, to just kind of, uh, you know, clearly clarify these things. If you take a chemistry like NMC, right? As I said, 3.2 volt is for uh, norm. Okay, it is 3.8. Here it is uh, 3.8, and it, this should be somewhere about 2.6 or 2.8 for LFP. If you take an NMC cell, right? NMC exhibits a different characteristics. The nominal voltage uh, or a fully charged voltage, right? Over voltage protection is 4.2 for a NMC. So NMC exhibits a, a characteristic curve, something like this. Okay, I mean, it can be uh, a very bad representation, but just for your understanding. So the cell voltage is more than a, uh, under voltage, over voltage cutoff is more than a LFP. Here also, if you take a BMS, right? If you see the curve is very flat here for LFP. Okay, it's a millivolt of difference per SOC change. 1% of SOC, you may have a millivolt of voltage value. I believe you're able to follow me. Uh, on this thing. But here, the every percentage of SOC drop, you can see a slight significant difference in the voltage of a cell with respect to a given condition, right? So it means the complexity to build a BMS for a LFP is more compared to something like an MC. So it's just so much to just choose something, you know, people talk like what is EV, just they put some motor and battery and you know run it. It runs. Now, that's just uh, layman stuff, right? But when you get into an engineering of battery uh, pack, or if you get engineering into really developing a vehicle, right? There's so much of so much of uh, efforts that companies put in 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 developing uh, uh, technology for EVs in place. So, any questions from anyone uh, at this point? Anyone has questions? Okay, uh, no questions from anyone. Okay, so what is thermal runaway, thermal runaway about battery? Okay, see, that's a very interesting topic and also it's, it's a very, very complicated topic. I don't want to be diplomatically answering that. Let me just give you something that I can bring up on my screen and share it to you. So SOE is called as safe operating area for a cell, all right? So I think you can see this image um, slightly observable, right? So there is a limit for a cell. That cell is happy. It may be in terms of its voltage, in terms of its temperature, in terms of current, it is comfortable within the limit. If you bring that stuff 
over that stuff, over the specific limitations, you're trying to cause some problems inside a cell in a very, very simplistic manner. Okay, it may sound very, very basic for somebody who already knows about cells, but it's kind of giving you an idea, All right? So that is what happening in an overall way. I think this this image gives you a pretty good idea. Lithium ion safety window. You are here where you need to operate your cell. At a given circumstance, that is why we use a BMS. But if you are BMS, not being able to identify certain potential scenarios, or BMS cannot go inside a cell, put a torch and see what is happening largely. The BMS can only identify the cell's condition by measuring temperature, measuring voltage, measuring current. But inside a cell, there can be a potential scenarios also that are happening. Okay. It may be any byproduct formation, like an acidic nature, acidic acids formation in the chemical reaction inside a cell. Or there is a formation of dendroids, rupturing of a uh, separator. A lot of things can happen inside a cell at a given circumstances of voltage, current, temperature. Now, when that goes above a specific limit, the first thing happens is a gas formation. It means there is a reaction. Reaction produces a gas. The gas creates the pressure. So, then thermal runaway events. Right. So, um, I don't think so. Yeah, it is more sufficient to kind of show uh, in this manner. Okay, the first phase is, I think, yeah, it may be, it's in, it's in German. Cool. The first in, it, it action is that, okay, there is a pressure in, in, in built in the cell. Then that leads to increase in pressure. It tends to a small rupture, then increased reaction. And then that leads to uh, excessive thermal increase. And then that leads to a fire. And then whatever that happens, happens further on. Okay. There's a phases through which it goes. So there are a lot of protection that we provide, maybe like PTC inside a cell. If the temperature is, if, if the pressure is going above specific value, there's a there's a, a circuit that can break off and disconnect anode and cathode. So a lot of protection activities are given inside a cell so that we can avoid a thermal event. But on a given uncontrollable circumstances, you can expect some amount of issues to happen. It could be problem with the cell. It could be operating above specific limits as a safety. It could be a mechanical issue, or it could be issue that has been caused by any external influences. Okay, like in Ether, you have seen that uh, vehicle was at an accident. It had a breakage of. Uh, uh, enclosure, it was brought into the garage, but they washed the bike and the water went inside that battery pack through the rupture. It went behind the control as a fire. Correct? So, the circumstance can be there with that situation. How do you select it? Uh, yes. Hi. Hi. I said, uh, what are the ways that we can control thermal runaway in EV batteries? Or, or, I, like a type of analysis, what, what are the analysis that can be performed? Sure, sure, sure. All right. So very, very fundamentally, selecting a cell becomes a very highly important parameter. Selecting a cell, looking at the application point of it. So there can be a lot of studies done first. Okay, what is the operating current for the cell over a lifetime? We all know that, okay, in India, like not only two people ride the bike, even sometimes it's three, and it's three with some extra weight and stuff like that, and various road conditions, road scenarios, and, and stuff like that. So you know what is the operating current uh, for the cell, so defined in terms of C rate. So always ensure that there is a enough buffer or a safety margin for the cell not to operate above its SOE. It means discharge limits. So you always have a protected environment for the cell as much as possible. There's a trade-off again. 
you, you just can't keep a cell uh, very very safe because it becomes a big battery pack and then it costs more and stuff like that so there is a perfect balance between what you can call as a safety and what you can call as a perfect design so first is rightly identifying the operating current second point looking around the thermal scenarios how impacts like environment can you know hook up on the temperature of the battery or temperature of the cells so studying at various different conditions and test cases becomes very very vitally right at a very application level or if you are choosing a cell subject a cell to a enormous number of tests even though your oem tells that okay this is great this is fantastically perfect cell but you can't trust anyone because your face value is there on the vehicle when it part bond so extensively studying number of test cases uh it can be good just at the selection of cell itself so you would do enormous number of tests uh subject the cell to a realistic behavior uh with respect to discharge cycles charge cycles temperature scenarios so you know the cell can withstand that kind of environment not only at a individual cell level even at a cell to a pack level as well so then in continuation to that you could perform uh, various type of uh, uh studies it can be mechanical uh, or it could be electrical so if it coming through electrical ensuring lot of safety points like you know uh, tesla also had a scenarios of fire even though we know them they are like godfathers of uh, best design so what thing is they have given protection within the cell they have ensured the the, the safety at each cell as a fuse like the wire binding method itself acts as a fuse then they are given a fuse at a module level they have a fuse at a pack level and they have a lot of electrons to engage in as electronic fuses as well but the problem is still with that we can see some scenarios are happening but ensuring that amount of safety itself uh, as in terms of a design at electrical level can be a lot of a generosity to ensure that there is a good amount of safety with all these things mechanically obviously it is something nobody can just just ignore that even above all of this your battery management system uh, should be able to perform uh, a rigorous amount of a uh, uh, level of safety it could be in any any manner that you have a lot of uh, sequencing situations you have a lot of uh, observation sequences uh, all these things are implemented so that the the battery management system has enough uh, data that that it can it can make a decision uh, so like this many many things will come overall level from fundamental selection of a cell to implementation to a pack level and also a responsibility for bms as well yeah i think that's some light i could just drop it out yeah yes uh yes we do have courses uh that is that is there on the platform can help you uh, to learn about simulations uh, so we guide a lot of engineers at industry which we train teams at industry to go through uh, uh right studies that they can you know uh take it up so yeah we do have courses that can help you to explore the programs in further great i think i just draw some lines i'm i'm sure i don't want to hold up for too long duration and uh, i wish i had a longer time to cover up sessions i would be very happy to come back and deliver sessions as well and in tomorrow but there is a some plan with uh, mr krishna to to do work on calculations and stuff like that with that way i just run you through few slides here and then i'll i'll uh, end my session so obviously there is something called as self safety we were discussing about it we spoke about some points but there is a functionality as a bms so this is like a like a uh, most spoken word today right so the battery management system it's like an embedded hardware combined with state algorithms or control algorithms or application softwares also a device drivers whatever it's called as a base software so it is a system that can give a protection to the pack also it take care of something called 
estimation also control. So if you want to talk about SOC, right? SOC is a set of charge. It's the amount of capacity that is left inside the or left inside the battery pack. The problem is it's not so easy to just draw one line and tell that okay, this voltage is this SOC. It's really complicated to predict an SOC because it is influenced by parameter of temperature, parameter of discharge current, parameter of cycle count, a lot of other things, right? So basically the device takes care of protecting the battery pack from over voltage protection, over current protection, under voltage protection, uh, under current protection, short circuit protection, um, insulation monitoring in a few cases. A lot of these things can be taken care of by a battery management system. So Decibles has a one nine months course on battery management algorithm itself, not only in the hardware, but only in the algorithm. It means it is such an amount of extensive job uh, to work on battery and battery management systems. So, and then uh, we have chargers, uh, which can take care of converting the AC to DC and also regulating the DC that is going into the charger. Because uh, let's just draw another slide here and to draw something to the picture. So let's take any uh, uh, lithium ion cell. Typically, uh, lithium ion cell will be happy to undergo something called a CCC, all right? So rather than me drawing this stuff here, so let me just bring something from the internet so that it becomes more easy for you also to see the screen. I think you may also know this. I don't know how uh, it's, it's knowing or not knowing, but Sorry, not for BMS, it's for uh, okay. So a cell is always charged in a specific fashion. You know, you just can't put any power supply to the battery pack or a cell, specifically lithium ion, because you would impact a largely on its charging behavior. So Typically, the way proven way is CCCV. It's called constant current and a constant voltage based charging. And it, it means you supply a specific amount of current for a specific duration. Then the voltage of the cell will gradually increase because when the cell is discharged, the voltage is somewhere about 2.8, depending upon the chemistry under voltage cutoff. So you charge a cell, it gradually rises up, all right? It gradually rises up and you are supplying a constant current. At a point where you define a value, then you taper down the current. It means you reduce the current that goes into the cell and gradually maintain the specific voltage, right? If you see here, right? So that you are, you are slowly bumping up the voltage, you're retaining the constant voltage. But here you are retaining a constant current, you're retaining, you're, you're gradually reducing the voltage current. So at a portion, you keep constant current, then you reduce the current. At a portion, you, you increase the voltage and retain a constant voltage. This is a proven method that seems to be more reliable for cells to get charged, okay? For the cells to get charged. Again, there are a lot of other methods that you could charge the uh, cell, lithium ion cell, charging algorithms. Okay. So there is something called, uh, mm, I wish I could just get that quick. Algorithm. Okay. I think, yeah. Cool, perfect, I got some image here. So it's like constant con constant current, constant voltage. It's called multi-stage multi constant current, constant current, pulsed charging, pulse charging, boost charging, voltage trajectory. Like this, there are very different methods you, you can use to charge the cell. So all these things has a desired impact on the cell, all right? So that is what technically you can take care of Take care inside the charger. There's a lot of technology. Again, we just talk about slow chargers, fast chargers, but largely that is what you, you do inside the charger. 
then apart from these things, there are a lot of auxiliary system, such as HVAC system, because you don't have compress engine to run a compressor. You need an electrical motor again to run a compressor if you want air conditioning system. If you want a heating system in the car, you don't have engine heat, right? You don't have coolant. Again, you need to use a different heating system to heat your cabin. Like this, there are a lot of systems that are different in EVs compared to IC engines. Similarly, if you want to do a braking, right? So you had a vacuum assistance from the engine. You don't have a vacuum anymore. You need to put a different motor that acts as a vacuum, okay? So that the braking system can function properly. So this is like way where, where EVs are far different than an IC engine. You know, for complicated than an IC engine. And uh, that's that's what I wanted to convey as a part of this about EV subsystems and technology. I believe you enjoyed the session. I believe it was informative for all of you. I believe by end of the session, you have some amount of knowledge takeaway. So over to you for any queries for another five minutes of quick chat. Um, and then we can wind up the session for today. Cool. So if anybody here would like to share your feedback as well, that you can unmute, unmute yourself, you can ask questions as well. Quickly, we just have five minutes. It's uh, 6.48. I eaten up too much of your time for sure. So what are the outcomes for the upcoming session? Okay. Right. So yeah, we have tomorrow session that will be practical, all right? It will be with the help of software. Like we will use Excel for right now because that is what we can give to you within the timelines, okay? So where you'll be able to learn how to, um, how you can decide upon component sizing for a static requirements. Again, if you would like to go for a dynamic requirements, you have to build a simulation models, all right? So we will give you an idea on how do we use this uh, toolboxes and stuff like that, okay? Tomorrow, our simulation engineer, Mr. Krishna, will deliver the session to give you an idea on how do you do a component sizing. Awesome. So great. Uh, looks like you all have enjoyed the session. Uh, if any feedback is there, feel free. Feel comfortable to share your feedback. Uh, we will be always happy to hear that so that we can improvise the session in the upcoming days as well. No, we Sorry. Okay, so can I share the presentation? I wish I would definitely do that, but there are some constraints as a company. We may not be able to do that. So do we get to see this recording anywhere? Absolutely, you can see. You have, we have streamed this on our YouTube channel, all right? So our team will send you the YouTube link, okay? Uh, let me just show it to you where you can actually see it. We are streaming this on our YouTube channel uh, so that you will be able to company uh, see that, um, you know, uh, recordings on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, this is a Decibels Lab YouTube channel. Uh, you can just, uh, you can see this has been live streamed right now on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, so yeah, you can just go here. I think I can just send you the channel. Okay, Vinayak, you have a quick option. Please do share it on the chat box. Perfect, yeah. Oh, we already shared it. So good. Guys, yeah, that's our YouTube channel. You can go there, you can subscribe yourself. Uh, you, can, you can see all the videos that we have done in the past. There is some fantastic free learning as well. You know, we don't do some short, short, short videos. It's all like one, two, three hours of length videos are there. But yeah, definitely you would enjoy uh, it to the best of it. Okay, so that's that's regarding the uh, where you can see the videos. Good. Uh, where you could actually take up a course? Yes, you can take up. Um, I can talk to you, um, Mr. Agar. So there is an options in our LMS. We have courses where you can definitely learn. By the way, you take a day tomorrow. I would suggest you. Then you can decide upon because there are a lot of different methods to model the battery or a motor, like passive static approach, dynamic approach. There's so many things, you know, that you can take up as a decision, but you can 
you can connect with me personally i'm just sharing you my number here if you are interested to learn uh, specifically on simulation i can throw up a better clarity on what you can actually learn and what is more useful for you uh, you can you can pick my number from the chat box uh, i have shared you so you, those somewhere you can you can talk to me and then i can give you a better clear direction on what what is required maybe you are a student or a working professional or an uh, academy or stuff like that i can suggest you a right one perfect so great then i think fantastic thanks a lot everyone uh, for being there for the last one and a half hour with me i wish i i did a justice uh, for your time and i believe you have enjoyed the session along with me um, thanks again everybody for taking up your time in attending this session and uh, it was great uh, interacting with all of you uh, thanks again everyone and good night to all of you attend the sessions tomorrow later as well um, so that you would be able to get a certificates for the participation more than a certificate knowledge is very important do participate gain exposure as best as possible right thanks everybody again good